welcome to the Engadget podcast for the week of May 6th. My name is Tim Stevens. I'm the editor-in-chief of Engadget, and we actually just did this before, but we had a technical difficulty, and now we're having to start again. Mm. Happy birthday, Tim. <laughs> oh, wait, no. No, it's my birthday this week. I'm sorry. Happy I birthday, can't... Brian. Happy birthday, Here. Brian. Thanks, guys. Hey, now, are you going to tell us how old you are? Nope. Still not? Nope. Really? 47 years young. <laughs> well, looking pretty good. Yeah, I've been we'll running f- a lot. We'll figure it out. Carrot juice. Carrot juice. Carrot juice. Uh, uh, wasn't this, was it cucumber juice? Carrot juice. That you made me drink out oh, of. Oh, no. That was a, a being John Malkovich that was, reference. That, that, was that probably dates me, actually, if you want to <laughs> yeah, find now, out what I'm exactly. then you figure out how old I am. Uh, yeah, you made me drink some sort of horrible vegetable juice. Yeah, it was cucumber juice. juice. It, 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 it cleans you out. Man. Tim is not a fan of vegetables. Not a fan of the vegetables. That's true. I'm <laughs> yeah. not going to deny yeah. that. I'm not not going to deny that at all. Uh, we are uh, here. We've got Brian Heater, whose mm-hmm. birthday is coming up at some undetermined time. This We've also got Peter Rojas, whose birthday is a uh, much more important date in uh, mid-March. <laughs> I can say that. <laughs> it's so important you won't yeah, even say what it so is. It's so important that it's also my birthday. Yeah. So uh, a little bit, yeah, a little bit of beautiful. I'm a little older, though. Cool. Well, the good show, guys. Um, thanks for coming out. Yeah, thanks everyone. For us. It's you know, it's you hard, guys missed it, a great hour. Yeah, it's hard getting your win. It's hard getting your win the second time when, it the, is. when the show. Um, it is. But you know what? Damn it, we're gonna do. We it put time. so much into the first ten minutes. Yeah, it was pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I think it well. kind of blew, guys. We went kind of blue at the uh, the last time I recorded this episode. Just like Microsoft, just Windows like Microsoft. Blue. Microsoft is working blue this time out. Okay, everyone, we got to make all the same jokes we okay. made last time. Good. <laughs> Why is blue a bad name, Tim? Uh, let's see. We've got the option that you just proposed to us. Sure. Which, which in past tense of blow. Correct. Uh, as well as the blue screen of death, which is, of course, a rather notable feature of previous versions of Windows. Joe really busted up when I conjugated there. <laughs> That's all it takes. Uh, Windows 8.1, so the, the release schedule is, uh, is changing. So we uh, got confirmation this week that it will be making an appearance at the Build Conference in June, which is really no surprise, given that's you know Microsoft developer sure. thing. Uh, so we're going to be seeing uh, more of, of Windows, whatever they call it. I don't well, think Blue's the final name. Anybody? Think I think that's Blue? probably just a code that's name. A code I name. hope so. Yeah. Let me, I sure hope so. Let me ask you this, because this has certainly been the case in, in recent years, and, and especially with, um, with, with Apple and Google, and I'm wondering just like traditionally how... Much developer conferences have really been, you know, places to launch new products. It's it's weird how they've become this kind of hotbed of of excitement. I O, I mean, has has definitely, yeah. of course, become very exciting. But build, I mean, I remember going to build yeah. in two thousand six, and it being, a, you know, them showing off a lot of really cool stuff there, and so it's definitely. Um, been a place where Microsoft and you know, just just as it has been for Apple, where they show off stuff. It's just never usually a place where we see a lot of consumer right. you know stuff that's necessarily intended for consumer con- you know for consumers it, it makes sense but though if, if you think about you know the fact that everybody's kind of moving away from this model where they're, where they're all launching stuff at like ces or mobile congress and they're trying to do it at their own events so they've already got kind of these big pre-existing platforms where there's a lot of eyes mm-hmm. and, and obviously it's a way to just kind of get excitement up around the product on a fairly yeah. regular schedule well, and yeah, I mean, the, and the the intention is really that developers are going to start to build stuff for sure. Windows 8.1, and that they have to get them uh, pretty pumped up about it. I I I, I does sound like they are going to have a release for consumers this year before the end of the year, which is good. Yeah, it certainly is. And what we're wondering though is how much of a departure from Windows 8 will this point release be, whether it's a service pack or, or whatever. Um, there's definitely been a lot of negative feedback for Windows 8, um, the lack of the start button being one big one yeah. and the inability to boot directly to a desktop being another one. Sure, and this is just an easier model for them. It's easier, you know, it's it, it's be, it's better from, from a sales standpoint, it's better from a PR standpoint to not have to wait three years to make all the changes that people want. And if mm-hmm. you think about it, you know, people's expectations have shifted as well. Now that, now that everybody's, you know, using so many services in the cloud right now people are using like facebook and google that they're they're used to these smaller incremental changes yeah well and also i don't think that um a major uh you know os release is necessarily as compelling a reason to upgrade uh, your machine as it used to be so people used to i mean i remember wanting to buy a new machine in 2001 because i wanted something that can run xp and i think that um you know for starters i mean you know windows 8 is compatible on a wider range of, of machines than, than uh, you know, maybe an earlier us in an earlier version of Windows would have been where it would have said we need a certain amount of, you know, RAM or whatever to be able to run. And Windows 8 has a lot of flexibility there, mm-hmm. just as Windows 7 did. And I think that, um, uh, you know, I, th- I think also that um, 
just you were saying, like the consumer expectations around um, improvements uh, uh, and incremental updates to OSs has changed. They expect stuff to be improved basically all the time, yeah. and there for to be changes and enhancements all the time. And if you look at like how Android has evolved, I mean, every time they roll out a, a new version of, of Android, not just going from a you know, from gingerbread to ice cream sandwich, but even going from ice cream sandwich to, you know, jelly bean, there were changes and enhancements to the to the UI. And consumers, I think, expect that and kind of, and for the most part, welcome it. I mean, kind of, it's frustrating when something changes that you like, but I think with all, like you were saying, Tim, like all the negative feedback that's come from Windows 8, I think people would say, okay, bring back a start button. Let me boot into the, the home yeah, screen. Yeah, and, and pe people, people expect small changes. I mean, when you're dealing with an operating system that so many people out there, so many casual users use, so many people use at their business, that you know they, they don't want huge changes. It trips people up. It, yeah. it, it changes the way you work, and you've essentially got to kind of relearn it. I mean, these are a lot of people out there who, you know, if you're using it, if if you're using it at your desk job and they upgrade, you, you there's a good chance you don't even know what version of the operating system you're using. There's a good yeah. chance you're probably still on XP. Too. Yeah. Well, and that's another True. thing is that a lot of companies, they don't switch their OSs because they have yeah. software that they don't, you know, isn't maybe compatible with the latest version or they just have security concerns and they, they have to go through a very long certification process for a new OS. And so they don't want to deal with that. They want to do that until Microsoft says, we're not going to support your OS anymore. Yeah, and yeah. pretty much kicks you off that it. platform. But, but yeah. I assume the pricing model has to change too, right? Because cause Apple's at what, like $40 for... 29. Uh, tw it's 30 It's 30 now, $30 mm -hmm. per year. Well, I believe but, it is, isn't it? Yeah. But I mean, but the issues for, for Apple and Microsoft are different because Apple doesn't license OS, you know, it's yeah. OS to, to other manufacturers. And so, the, I mean, the costs are concerns are the structures are different it's but, but i don't think they're gonna I, I don't think they're gonna be able to charge you know three hundred dollars no 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 but I, I mean definitely like the price pressures are, are on I, I mean just for the the fact of the matter that um what an os is as a percentage of the overall price of a pc, PC. i mean you can't sell a, a pc for six hundred dollars and have the os cost 150 bucks yeah well this this actually is uh, I, I didn't end up putting it on the outline but i mean it, it, adobe is kind of moving in that direction yeah. too right they're they're i mean everybody's moving towards a subscription model because you know people's expectations are different yeah and it'll be interesting to see how Microsoft kind of shifts in that regard for the operating system. Obviously, they pushed that way with uh, Office recently going with the subscription model there. Um, and it would make sense to do that for an operating system as well versus charging for updates like, like Apple's doing. I think that would make a lot more sense for them. But whether people would be amenable to that approach uh, for an operating system, uh, I know I would rather just pay once and own the thing yeah. and not have to worry about activation servers going down or anything like that. Um, but, you know, I guess maybe I'm old school in that regard. It, 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 yeah, it is. It is weird to think of um, basically renting your operating system for something that's that's so fundamental for your well, computer. Well, and I think also most people, since they get the OS when they buy the computer, yeah. to suddenly yeah. say, "Well, if you want updates, you got to suddenly shell out of pocket for that on some subscription basis." Mm. Um, I mean, it's just. I mean, I, I certainly people might feel value in that, but it's one of those things where they're not going to start to pay for the subscription until the new version is out, and that sort of defeats the purpose. So, so I, what I'm wondering is, is if this gives Microsoft license to be a little more, you know, experimental in the way that 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 you know Google is, for example, where they'll kind of throw out a feature and if it doesn't work, they'll pull it back. But they'll kind of come out with some really interesting stuff because it seems like the lesson learned here is, you know, don't don't do something too radical. Right? Yeah, I mean, I I think if anything, they'll be a little bit more conservative with these yeah. updates. But they certainly can be a lot more agile doing these sorts of things. But again, this isn't really any different than what they've done in the past. I think this is just going to be labeled a little bit differently with a service pack versus a point release versus whatever. What the, the big question is, what do they do next? Do they continue with this sort of annual iterative upgrade to the operating system versus a big major release going forward? Or is this just like SP1 was for XP, adding in some functionality and fixing some bugs? Um, I feel, like, we'll I mean, if I had to guess, I'd say that we'll see it, you know, yearly updates, and then we'll see like a big. You know, I think so like too. Like Windows nine in like two years. I think so like too, that. and 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 I think that's probably the best model. I mean, yeah. you know, I I think we're all kind of waiting for a big new upgrade from for for OS ten, right? I mean, yeah. it's been so long. It's been nice getting something every single year, but it really should be some sort of model where you're getting some kind of point grade every every year and then every few years. Well, it's been how larger. many years since OS ten was first released? Was it two thousand one? God, 
Yeah, that sounds And we right. forget it's how much of a mess it was yeah. when it first came I mean, out. Yeah. It didn't I don't think it had DVD support. No, yeah, I mean it was such it was such a radical departure from from for nine. It, it's you know, maybe yeah. not to March 24th, 2001. Yeah, I saw twenty. Yeah, two thousand one. Yeah. yeah, I remember. Two thousand one um, was a big year for Apple. Um, yeah, <laughs> iTunes and and the iPod. Yeah, uh, but but you know, may, I, yeah, I mean, it, 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 was, it was similar to what 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 Microsoft is running into to right now with backwards compatibility too, right? I mean, you had yeah. to run, you essentially had to run an emulator on your desktop in order to use any of yeah. your software. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I remember. And then when they got rid of the emulator for OS 9 like people were pretty upset yeah. mm-hmm. uh, but it was time to move on but you know I, 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 th- I like I said like I, I hope that they Microsoft takes to heart some of the feedback that people are getting you know around around Windows and um, I hope that they do some sort of start button I hope that um, one of the things that surprised me is, is you think about how the, the nice the flatness of the design of, of what are we even calling that Me- not Metro, Metro. Metro. Uh, the tiles the tiles and the fact that that the desktop mode isn't as flat as it could be. I mean, I think mm-hmm. that you, they could have brought some of, they could have harmonized the design. Um, I mean, even things like you go into like the control panel on the, the de- in the desktop mode and um, it's just, there are little things where you're like, hey, you need to update this or you need to yeah. harmonize the design. Yeah. Or For me, it's really annoying that if you're changing settings, even through the Metro interface, occasionally you'll get to a depth where you want to change a setting and then it'll drop you out of the Metro settings into the control panel on the, on the dash the desktop which to me is really really jarring especially if you're you know in a tablet a touch yeah. interface yeah, yeah it's it's just it, the two are completely yeah off from one but but i i mean it, it feels like that and just having you know been i mean i use windows 8 like fairly regularly and um it it, it, it seems like th- that they should have imported more of that that flat style design and maybe they will with with 8.1 well yeah but obviously that's something that they should have done right mm-hmm. off the bat because it would have eased people exactly it would have made people feel like there's less of a a dichotomy between the two experiences you feel like okay here's one sort of thing and here's another um you know and 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 it's funny because like when microsoft did um if you remember windows media center i do um you know that was a way of having a a different mode Mm -hmm. that actually did work pretty well with the rest of of what you did i mean yeah it's meant for tvs and a sort Mm -hmm. of lean back experience but it it didn't feel as jarring to go from one to the other like the designs harmonized better yeah, I, I, I'd love to see some sort of study done uh, as to you know what percentage of people upgraded to Windows 8 and just ended up using the standard UI, like the older legacy UI. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm doing almost exclusively yeah. since I upgraded to, to Windows 8 for the review. Um, every day, the first button I click on is the, the desktop button, yeah. which then takes me back to all my legacy apps. You know, I'm running Pigeon for IM and, and if I'm ever using a browser, it's Chrome, not through the Metro interface. Uh, I, I don't th- think there's a single... I have to. I take that back. There's one app that I use through Metro. It's Skype because I don't have an option. Because once you install Skype, yeah. you cannot disable it, which is the most annoying oh, thing in funny. the world. So I mean, it, it's pretty clear that Microsoft is working up to a point where they're just going to be able to abandon that that user interface altogether. The desktop wonder, mode? Yeah. You don't. You I, don't think so? I don't know. I mean, I'm not even sure that. I mean, I guess it's debatable, but I, I think that. Um, I think that we'll start to see just, I, I think if they're smart, they'll start to blur the boundaries between the two. Yeah, more. I mean, well, you know, maybe maybe now with the feedback they've, they've been getting, but I know it really seemed when Windows 8 came out that that was the end goal. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. They, they, they do need to blur the line a bit more, but I mean, you can also say that maybe they're just going to try to kill off the desktop altogether. Which is what it feels like, and, and God, that's definitely something they can't do with 8.1, right? That's no, 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 no. We're a long way away. They won't do it. do that. Um, I, sw- I was sweating a little bit. <laughs> but they did sell 100 million copies of something else that they announced. Um, so that's 40 million since the holidays. So it's it's not exactly, you know, uh, a flop by any means. But it's not exactly... I don't think it's a flop. I just either. don't think it's gotten there yet. Mm-hmm. And I think it, it could. I'm, and I, I mean, there is... Um, one of the things that I will give Microsoft credit for, and I don't think they get enough credit for this, is that they did take a risk with mm-hmm. Windows 8. Yeah, big one. And if you think about them as a company as, as being sort of having a... a, a there being a perception of them as this very conservative, yeah. stodgy organization that doesn't take risks. The fact that they were able to kind of bet, make a big bet on their number one franchise like this, it, it didn't work out to the extent that I think they wanted it to, <laughs> yeah. but maybe that's an understatement. But the fact that they actually did take a risk and tried to do something different, I actually want to encourage that. It's just a weird place to take that risk. It seems like it's a weird, it's a, it's weird to make that bet on something that has such a large install base and that people are again so used to 
working through those steps to just kind of essentially pull the rug out from under them. I think yeah. they just felt that they needed to to really kickstart their presence on tablets, yeah. and this is their way of doing it. Rather than trying to move from the mobile OS, where they haven't had any success anyway, they'd rather try to move people from I Windows know, to the tablets. By creating an uh, operating system that <laughs> owes everything to the mobile OS. Yeah, yeah, I well, know. I mean, it's, like, it's, the execution been could have been better, Mistakes but I me. think that, like, <laughs> but I'm saying, like, the fact that <laughs> yeah. they actually tried well, to do I, something I is, I, is, is ultimately I a good thing. And, and they've, they've, been, they've been getting, they, they've definitely been getting much better about that. I, I, I don't think it's, you know, I think the connect is a good, yeah. you know, it's something old, to point to where, where zillions and zillions of the most successful yeah. hardware device at the time. I mean, that's, yeah. a, you know, and, and, and I guess you can, you know, you can certainly point to the, the Wii as being kind of a stepping stone to that, but that's mm. a good example of them. And and they don't and they also don't get enough credit for the fact that that I mean obviously they've got a lot of really smart people over there but you know they've got Microsoft Research they've got their own version of you know Google's X Labs over there I I just don't think that there's enough of that bleeding over into their mainstream releases and I'd like to see a lot more of that yeah I agree with that who remembers the Evo 3D oh I do that was going to really kick off a new wave and. You know, you know what was lacking. 3D. You know what was lacking on that. I mean, you know why I didn't break through. Stuff. What, what's, what's that, Brian? Special offers. <laughs> targeted <laughs> advertisements targeted advertising. that take down the price of the hardware. That's well. That's something. I was. I my my Kindle. I haven't. I haven't plugged. I haven't plugged. Maybe my we should Kindle explain in. to people what we're talking about. <laughs> Let me tell this unrelated anecdote okay. first, Peter. Let me derail the conversation. <laughs> oh, excuse me. <laughs> I got, no, but uh, okay. So we're t- we'll we'll you know broadly we're we're obviously we're talking about Amazon and Am- Amazon has done this really this this interesting thing where I you know they could have easily have just said yeah we're we're giving you advertisements on these devices it's it's taking down the price but instead what they're doing is saying hey check out these super great special offers that you're super excited to have and, like and they're so beautiful and so amazing looking that you'll never notice that they're advertising they they'll never notice the difference and it's and and I got a note on my Kindle cuz I haven't plugged it in in a while saying hey don't you want the latest special offers <laughs> why haven't you synced yeah, it up in a while uh, yeah, yeah, I get that on my Kindle a lot because I always just turn the Wi-Fi off to save the battery. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, yeah, it starts complaining after a couple of weeks, like, hey, you should really turn the yeah. Wi-Fi back on there, buddy. I want to know what Twilight movies I miss my friends. Yeah, exactly. My yeah. offer friends. Yeah. <laughs> they, haven't, they have not done a good job targeting those special offers. I've never, I've never seen something that is clearly related to what I've been buying yeah. in the yeah, store. Yeah, I've been getting to the Twilight thing, Well, they keep too. trying to sell me a case for my Kindle. Well, that's fair. Wow. Yeah. How do they figure out that you owned a Kindle? I know, I know. That's some targeting, right? <laughs> Would you like to cover this product <laughs> i mean i i got an ad i was i was again further away from the conversation but i got an ad i was uh uh i can't even remember what website i was on but i got a little ad in the corner that said hey you haven't completed your zappos order like i forgot to finish the transaction That's and then two creepy. days later i was on another site and it was asking me to finish my that zappos is creepy order. Uh, if you haven't figured it out by now we're talking about <laughs> amazon uh, there was uh, reports this week that they're working on not just one smartphone which we've been talking about for a long time now yep. but multiple smartphones In multiple dimensions Yes, with one of which will have a 3D display a la the Evo 3D. That's bringing us right back to the beginning of this non sequitur. <sighs> yeah. Now let's move on. I don't know. Oh, no, there's another thing in there, too, that, that, that struck me as strange was um, uh, a streaming portable audio device. So essentially, yeah, if I can wrap my, my brain around this, this is basically an iPod touch without any built-in was hardware. Was it a portable device or was it just an audio streaming device? It wasn't clear to me. Mm. I thought it was a portable. My, my person was a portable device. You think it just might be like kind of like a, a cable box for it audio? It could be like a Sonos kind of competitor yeah. or something like Which that. Which would make a lot more sense if we're talking streaming because, I mean, there were those uh, XM portable devices that were really awful a while back. Oh, they were slacker. You know, yeah, yeah, but there haven't really been any successful mobile streaming Devices. I, but but here's of. here's one of the things that 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 tripped me up on that. Other than I think that the portable version is probably not a I don't great think idea. It's going to be portable. Uh, but but the other thing that that tripped me up is um, it seems like in order for this to really be successful, if they're only giving Amazon content, that they should have a subscription service. Or are you only you know are, are you playing mm. just stuff from your hard drive and stuff that you've downloaded from from their cloud? Well, all, they have. I mean, they, all your vinyl they're, that you they're pushing their Amazon there. music, their Amazon you know cloud music service, which oh, oh it's kind of loud over here, and not just us for a change. Um, the uh, you know, and I, I mean, it's like twenty five dollars a year, I think, and I upload it, and they do matching, and they let you upload yeah. your music. So for me, that was actually a pretty you know good yeah. solution. Whereas I took like all like. 350 gigs of music that I have or so and like uploaded it, it took a few days mm-hmm. uh, but once I got it up there you know 
um, cause I have a lot of stuff that's not available on Spotify and, and things you sure. know, that aren't going to get licensed. Uh, and so it was nice that to be able to have demo. that demo. Yeah, exactly. So it's like for 25 bucks, it's like, you know, it's not so much to spend to also to have frankly a backup of my, you know, my music. Somewhere. Sure. Uh, you, you, you don't see, um, you don't see a, a subscription service like a Spotify competitor playing I think that? I have a feeling that they might want to do it. I, th- I think it's getting harder to get those licenses now. Yeah. I think that Apple's having a lot of trouble. I think Amazon, is, if, they, if they've explored it, are probably going to have trouble. Um, it just it would make sense for a device like totally, this. It would totally make sense. And, and I think that, um, but I think the other thing is like they could sell them for so little now. I mean, the idea of like having a device that's, you know, has Wi Fi and, uh, you know, an optical out jack and, you know, and, well, and yeah, all I it mean, does that's is, uh, uh, stream music and you control it from your phone. That's kind of going to, I mean, that that's going to continue to be Amazon's yeah. hardware approach. That's probably all the devices a $20 is, device. Yeah, the lowest cost device that just gets you into that ecosystem. Yeah. And even if it's, you know, e- even if it's something they're giving away for close to free. What if they make it ball shaped, have some okay. blinky LEDs on there, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and charge $300 for it? I mean, that's another approach. Mm-hmm. What if it's on a set of glasses? What if there's a streaming mm-hmm. audio device that's on, like, you know? So I mean, they're not you, really you glasses, on your face though. is what you're saying. Yeah, but they don't have lenses. Okay. It's really just a frame. Okay. I like that. You like where I'm going with this? <laughs> so many great ideas coming out of this podcast. It's, uh, so but, all but these so investors are hanging off our every word, <laughs> yeah, I think. Yeah, I know. But th- a 3D, I mean, do we think a 3D... I wonder, okay, <laughs> to me, like, this feel. I don't want to say, I mean, I don't, I have no idea what, what they're doing. Um, but if this was like some artful misdirection on their part, oh, I, love it. I would love it. Mm-hmm. It would be so great for them to be like, oh yeah, we're doing a 3D phone. And everyone's like, oh, a 3D phone. I love the, I love the idea of them like going to, this was the Wall Street Journal, right? Yes. Yeah. Of, just, of them going to like, you know, sitting in bathroom stalls next to each other and having a really loud conversation about the 3D phone yeah. they were going to launch. Oh yeah, we're going to do a 3D phone. It's yeah. going to be awesome. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I don't. It, it, I thought it, it felt like people, the industry just had given up on trying to push, at least in this iteration, push well, people. to be clear, uh, so here's the, the exact <laughs> quote. It's a retina tracking technology that creates visuals that, quote unquote, seem to float above the screen like a hologram. So, so it doesn't necessarily have to be an actual 3D screen with lenticular lenses built into it like on the Evo 3D. It could be some, like a trick where basically you can move the phone around and you can change the perspective of what you're looking could at. Could be on a lens in front of your could eye. Could be on a lens in front of your eye. Uh, so you're talking about like those old um, those baseball cards. You have those baseball cards where you hold it in a different direction. No, that's lenticular. Yeah, that, that's basically what the Evo 3D is, yeah. just a more high yeah. advanced. But what I'm talking about is something. it is a 2D display, but it can track where you are. So as you move your face, the perspective of what you're looking at changes. Yeah. So it's another way of giving you a 3D like impression. So like uh, like the uh, Wii, the Wii U, where <laughs> you can hold it yeah, in yeah. different directions. A little bit like the Wii U, but I suppose. I'm yeah. trying to figure out like what, how does this fit in with their strategy? Which I assume if they're going to do a phone, they're going to try to sell one as cheaply as possible. Yeah. But if this is supposed, to, I mean, this would be something that I assume the technology would be. At least a well, little expensive. I could see I could right. see them doing something similar to what they're doing with the Fire, where there's a premium device and a lower cost device, certainly. But even their premium device is still pretty cheap. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it feels like it's got to be a gaming. So, it, I mean, is Amazon going to make a big push on the gaming front and try to make some oh, money in that regard? I mean, that seems like a real difficult proposition to, yeah. to put yourself into this, you know, subset of a gaming market, which would be, you know, a fraction of the Android gaming scene. Well, they already have their own support Android for 3D. store. Right, but how many people are actually going to go out and buy a 3D phone just to play 3D games? I don't think Unless there's much. you know support from HTC and everybody else yeah. as well, which there wouldn't be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, I, was, I was having like I, I was talking to, to Ben Gilbert earlier. There, there was um, a story about uh, uh, the Wii U, the mm-hmm. Wii U maps. We, uh, mm-hmm. yeah. come, and and, yep. and it's 3D. it's kind of a similar situation where it's like where you create the technology and you don't have enough interesting applications for it that yeah. you just like have to sell things as being interesting mm-hmm. and 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 in the case of the Wii U it's like it's got this Google Maps on it but you're not going to take it out of your apartment so what's the point Yeah for Nintendo I think that's all we can well, learn from that so we could do a whole podcast story. about we that We could yeah especially and we have well, yeah, maybe we should maybe we should do a special episode next time. But, but all this, the things Nintendo's been doing. But you know, unless they've got some really really amazing idea up their sleeve, it's right. going to be them waiting for developers to create something interesting. Yeah, so far Amazon's had the best success by doing something that's almost as good as everybody else for a lot cheaper. Uh, and I think yeah. that that's I mean, on a smartphone because they have the content. 
to back it up. Right. So on a smartphone, I mean, to, to have a device that is cheaper than a competing smartphone, presumably with some sort of a, a partnership with a carrier to give you a cheaper data access yeah. as well, and then with access to movies and everything else, uh, I mean, that would be a very compelling proposition. A 3D phone that can do more advanced gaming? Uh, the, even that, but I, the, to me, the cheaper phone is becoming a harder and harder sell because it seems like the price is coming down and the hardware is still staying you know, pretty yeah. decent. So, they God, they would have to undercut it by a lot. I mean, how many like, how many decent phones at this point can you get for basically free by signing up for that contract? Well, but that's I, the thing. Maybe there's no contract. There's no contract. Yeah. And I think that I mean, it's it's always tougher to sell a phone than a tablet, right? Because of the contract issue. Um, and I think that uh, if they're, I mean, I, I think that the, the, there's going to be a tremendous amount of price pressure, like you're saying, on them. Um, I think the thing that Amazon has going in its favor are a few things. I mean, one, they're extremely comfortable with very slim margins. And uh, they have, obviously, <laughs> the uh, a lot of expertise at getting people to buy things. Yeah. And I think that they feel pretty confident that they can sell a significant number of phones to people just via the channels that they already have. The they target. have the best billboard on the internet. Yeah, right exactly. Now. I mean, mm -hmm. if you had to pick a place to try to sell your product, yeah. I mean, Amazon's the place right now. The and front the, page, and if you go there to buy like yeah. an iPhone, they're immediately going to sell you on their own device. <laughs> I mean, that's right? why it's like, I mean, even though I, I don't think that they've sold tens of millions of, of Kindle fires, but I think they've sold enough for them to feel pretty happy with the business. Yeah. And they've done that at a time when it's become extremely competitive. I mean, just with, you know, the Nexus and... Uh, the iPad Mini. I mean, the low end of that market's really, really tough right now. They've also got enough money to 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 fail for a couple of years too. I mean, <laughs> they they can certainly put it out there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they've been taking taking a beating uh, on every front for a long time now, making very very narrow profits, if any profit at all. Well, um, I, I think the thing is, I, I think I wrote this for Gadget about a year ago. Is that um, what do they have to lose by getting into the market for smartphones? It's still, I mean, it's not, the market's obviously consolidating and not as up for grabs as it might have been a few years ago, but it's still pretty open, especially in that low end of the market. And if they take a shot, they can lose the money. If it doesn't work, yeah. it's not the end of the world. But yeah. if it does work, it's a huge success for them. So they do, do they basically just scale down the fire operating system? Is that, you know, is, is, is this basically yeah, a content okay. device that also has some other, you know, web <laughs> browsing features in it? In it? I put a dialer Probably. in Probably, yeah. Yeah, they've already got nice. their own app market for Android apps on yep. phones. Even they've got you know yep. mm -hmm. uh, Kindle reading on phone. They got Audible on phones. It feels like they've got the the content that they would need to make it a compelling operating. Though system. I haven't it's been able to get the Amazon App Store working on the HTC One. Oh really? Yeah, That's interesting. it works on, on my Note Two. Uh, yeah, it works on everything else I've tried it on. Huh? Yeah, it always. I don't know. And and it's been a couple of years since I had an Android device, but it always felt really kind of clunky and and yeah. much harder to use than than Google. Yeah, yeah um, that's safe to say. Yeah. Uh, another thing I've, I failed to put on the uh, on the outline. Something about Microsoft, perhaps. Oh no, but oh, it, no. it's actually totally related to that. And this was something. This was um, news. I think we got just as the last podcast was ending. But I think this is plays into both that story and the other story in an interesting way. Was the the news that um, was the news that that Barnes and Noble was opening up the Nook tablets to Google Play. No. You know, going oh, right. in an entirely yeah. different direction. You yeah. know, obviously a lot of that comes down to the fact that they're not the content powerhouse and it will never be the content powerhouse that, that um Yeah, that they're not is. getting the developer support that they need to really have a compelling market on their own. Yeah, that was that was a, a weird conversation to have. And that was I think one of the and, and this this doesn't happen very often, but it's nice when it does to um, to have a meeting with somebody, to have them tell you about this 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 product, and have you basically say back to them something they had told you a while ago, and for them to say, "Yeah, we listened to consumer feedback and we realized it was wrong." The original argument being that, like, um, you know, this is a device with a very specific screen type, very specific resolution, very specific format. Android is is so kind of you know fragmented at this point that you're not going to get the best experience possible unless it's made for that device. Yeah. Which I mean is probably true to some degree, but you know, they they were playing these games straight out of Google Play and I I couldn't tell the difference. They look they looked fine on this device. And that could be a very co compelling option. You can definitely get those apps on the Kindle Fire if you want to, but it's you got to jump through hoops. Yeah. Um so to be able to have access to that I think will help, but ultimately, you know, it's it's not a, an easy thing for for Mars Noble right now the, to make the, a big jump. They're, yeah, they're, it's, well, and it sounds like they're going to be getting out of the 
the, the Android tablet business entirely. Altogether, yeah. So there was a report from TechCrunch this week that uh, Microsoft might be picking up uh, the rest of Nook Media. They already own, I think, 18% of, of that um, because of the, those lawsuits back and forth a while ago. And the, the result of that was basically a partnership between Microsoft and, uh, and Barnes & Noble. But uh, the report was that Microsoft would be paying a billion dollars to pick up the rest of Nook Media and effectively take over the Nook business altogether. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 big, the big difference there, again, is that, y- you know, I... When you're talking about a $200 tablet, it seems like the only business model that makes sense is making that money up later through content. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. like them, I don't know, from from a from a financial standpoint of actually making money off these devices, there it doesn't make sense. I think if people are going to get excited. I think a lot more people are probably going to buy them now because they are really nice pieces of hardware, and this makes them a lot more compelling with this open, but it's yeah. going to be a lot harder for them to actually not lose money on these it's, devices. It's interesting to think if Microsoft would continue to make Android-based devices, or would they try to turn these yeah. into Windows RT-based Although devices? Although they do, they do make money off of every Android device oh, yes, sold. Yes, so. yes, we, pointed, yes, we love pointing <laughs> yeah, yeah, out. They will not be continuing. I, I, it's not even clear to me that they'd be picking up that part of the business anyway. So it's... Um, yeah. yeah, it's a little bit murky. TechCrunch does talk about... Microsoft taking over the Nook business entirely. And for a billion dollars, you would hope that they would get that. But ultimately, this Nook Media company was really founded for the software and for some educational titles from, and you know a subset of the Nook business. So uh, that is a little bit unclear at this point. But again, it's, it's basically just uh, talk from TechCrunch at this point. Which I mean, we the e-readers are still great products, and I think people are, are, are buying them. They're certainly not as successful as, as the Kindle, but you right. know, I see them. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I see them on subways and and uh, on planes again. Not as much yeah. as not as much as uh, a Kindle or you know a playbook. Or but and, and but but again, I mean that that's you know that's that's a market <laughs> that's a market that they've. Uh, how can you tell if it's a, a fire or a playbook? It's it's hard to know. I can uh, tell. Very okay. similar. I can tell. The buttons uh, are on the different side. Uh, I have no idea. Where you can see the that. agony on the uh, playbook <laughs> user's face. <laughs> yeah. Oh, just just that you know, um, you know, I, I, uh, Barnes and Noble has a foothold in in e-readers in a way that they don't in tablets, and probably never really mm-hmm. will in tablets. And yeah. that's th- that. I think that that for a little while, that's a uh, you know a, a a market that's still going to continue to be successful for them. And so it would make sense for them, for the very least, to keep that going. Well, we'll see. I will say that the the the, ta- the Nook tablets are a good deal right now. With Absolutely. The sale that they're having on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the the Mother's Day this weekend. Sale. Yeah. yeah. Especially with Zach's to the Play Store. I, I've considered. I mean, just considering that the the screen resolution of the, uh, which the plus it, the plus mm-hmm. yeah the plus is I think is nineteen twenty by ten eighty and then the the regu- the other one is fourteen forty by. I yeah I don't know that I'm ahead, but they both got yeah they've got crazy the pixel has, a, has a high resolution yeah mm-hmm. the both of them do someone's gonna someone's gonna fact check this for me yeah um, uh, no but I thought the no, pixel density on the seven was actually higher, um, which w- uh, I didn't don't. I Let's could be wrong. See. I don't think so, but I could be wrong. It's 240, yeah, 1440 by 900, so it's 243 PPI on the Nook HD, and then the, um, let's see, let's do this. This is great. This is great. Really compelling great. stuff. How you doing, Brian? What do you want for your birthday, Brian? Oh, you know, you're right. It's higher pixel Look, density on the uh, on the the HD plus because it's yeah, yeah. It's 1920 by uh, 1920 by 1280. Yeah, so really uh, they're, I mean, they're really yeah. they're really they're both great. really nice. They're yeah. great pieces of hardware. They mm-hmm. they really yeah, are. Yeah, they've but, all been. But I don't. Well, maybe maybe this is um you know Microsoft obviously wants to get more of the hardware game. Maybe this is a way to make. Yeah. It would certainly be a bold bet by Microsoft to getting into a very. Well, a market that nobody else has been able to to come anywhere near challenging Amazon uh, from the reader standpoint than from a tablet standpoint. I mean, they need all the help they can get. This is at least a somewhat established brand, which is more so than, yeah. uh, I mean, the Surface. Yeah, I was trying to think of a nice way to say that that Surface hasn't exactly established itself. But uh, I mean, I think Nooks are probably a little bit more recognizable than the Surface. But you can't. Out. But yeah. but but if you're Microsoft, you can't sell that and not dump Windows 8 on yeah. it, right? Or Windows RT. Yeah. Or this could just be. Who knows? Who knows? We'll wait for the official report. You know, although uh, you know, I cer- certainly, certainly, I could see a a, a point where they d- they just have a much larger investment in the company, mm-hmm. but still let them operate. Sure, doesn't seem completely a ridiculous proposition. Sony did something unexpected <laughs> <clears throat> this quarter. They made money. They made money for the first time since 2008. So basically for as long as almost as long as the PlayStation 3 has existed, Sony has not turned a profit. Um, yeah. PlayStation 3 it was 2006, so it's 
just about as long as that. Four hundred fifty-eight million dollar profits, which is pretty pretty solid um, for a company that hasn't made. It's profits. even more solid if you say it in yen. Forty-three billion yen profits. So <laughs> congratulations, Sony. Uh, we got a nice picture of Casarai smiling as well. He should. Um, yeah, or, it's probably going to be a pretty pretty decent decent year for them as well. Yeah, I mean, for them to be able to turn a profit on the eve of them launching a new console, yeah. you know, when they've got manufacturing costs are probably starting, well, I guess that would probably be this upcoming quarter, but ultimately they've been spending a lot of r and I'm sure, at this point and to, to launch the new PlayStation. people buying PlayStation 3s with the... Uh... Yeah, in fact, GameStop this week stopped accepting PlayStation 2s, yeah. which, which gives you a sign that the writing's on the wall mm-hmm. there for the PlayStation it's 3, probably. probably. PlayStation 1. Really? Yeah. Well, welcome to the party, buddy. That's not true. No. Okay. Uh, so Sony made some money. Uh, so uh, TV sales were down, but uh, smartphone sales were up, and software sales were up as well. To and kind TV of make sales were down pretty much across the board. Yeah, 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 absolutely. That's definitely it, and that's going to be a huge challenge for for Cas and for Sony going forward. I mean, that's a huge portion of their business and one of their most successful portions. It is, but but they're you know they're they're pretty well diversified. You know they. They, they they I don't think they're leaning entirely on that at this point. No, but that's definitely you know. Sure. That's definitely something that people have come to associate with Sony is their TVs. And, and they're still good, but ultimately people aren't buying as many. And, you know, maybe 4K will be the saving grace for everybody. Mm. Does anybody really think that? Uh, I'm a little skeptical in this room. I, I think that there's going to be a, a is content probably. issue. With, uh, <laughs> no, they're, they're launching their own, uh, you know, they, they, they will be the it's number gonna, It's not going to be enough. No, but they'll be the number one right. content provider of 4K for whatever that's worth. So it's that's one about like 4K, Sony's in the best <laughs> I, show. I know. I know. That's, yeah. That's not gonna. That's not gonna do. It's it. like having more unicorns than anyone else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're beautiful things, Ryan. Yeah. So it's 4K. You know who else made money? Oh, uh, Elon Musk. Yeah. Well, I actually I don't know if Elon Musk has made. He's been I'm investing sure a lot, so great. I bet you his net worth is. I don't know. If Stark Industries is doing great. Too. <laughs> I don't think we're allowed to talk about his net worth. <laughs> Probably best to not do so. Uh, he Tesla's might, birthday. He, he'll be extremely unhappy. Uh, his company, however, uh, did make a profit. $15 million profit on $562 million, uh, which was uh, a pleasant surprise. I, I think that you know Tesla, I think, is still very early in terms of where it wants to be. Uh, so for them to be turning a profit on on you know very early sales of the Model S, very limited sales of the Model less, I think, is, is great news. And this despite the New York Times attempt to crush it. Yes. To take that, destroy New York company. Times. Yeah, what's your network, <laughs> David Pogue? Liberal media. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, but this is, I mean, this is, this to me is similar to um, like JetBlue or Virgin getting into um, the airline industry where it was people, I think people were just ready for like a totally new mm-hmm. take on automotive. Yeah. Consumer Reports just filed their report on the Model S and gave it 99 out of 100 for quality, which is uh, pretty pretty compelling as well that's, that's a big deal one of their highest rated cars of all time um so it's a great car it's a really nice car yeah i mean obviously it's got some limitations largely related to, to charge and range and that sort of thing and it is also not a cheap car they just got rid of their cheapest model so i think 70 grand is now the lowest point of entry for this car which of course for people like brian is no problem at all for me a little bit more expensive we can't both buy him one for his birthday let's see you know. oh man i, I gotta I, think of something else don't then. fight yeah <laughs> <laughs> don't fight guys uh tesla also launched a new performance package plus model uh for those who want a little bit more performance uh not actually acceleration uh, but it's basically a new suspension package which improves or, or reduces body roll which actually was one of the issues that i had in the car um the back battery pack is what is not very low in the car, so it mm. corners very well. But if you're doing transitional cornering from left to right, it actually does wallow a little bit, which I complained about in my review. But now there'll be thicker roll bars available for a $6,500 option. I just don't think everybody's driving their Tesla the way a Tim Stevens would drive yeah, Everybody Tesla, should. <laughs> or at least ride along with Tim Stevens <laughs> driving their Tesla. The wallow is big, big concern. <laughs> for mine. The rear end does sort of wallow around. So, so that's a new option. Uh, you can actually get it retrofitted to your older car for thirteen grand, though, which is a little bit um, a little pricey. Uh, but there's also uh, new tires and new wheel set, which will increase performance and give you longer range too. Yeah, I, it's sh- it's just it's one of those items where it's 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 like once you've bought into it, they're just assuming that price probably isn't really a deterrent for you. Safe to say, yeah, I think I think that's true, and I think it's I think it's an exciting future that Tesla is is kind of building on, and we learned a little bit more about that too with them talking. Elon Musk made some kind of casual, offhanded remarks about working with Google about autonomous mm-hmm. driving. Um, it's really hard to say if this is an actual official partnership or if this is just something that he's kind of talking with them about. Yeah, it's just one of his really rich same. guy parties, like him and Eric Schmidt mm-hmm. again. You mm-hmm. know. Toilet, uh, toilet stalls, adjacent Talking toilet stalls. Talking about 3D stalls. phones Talking and autonomous phones, cars. And this, I mean, but, but again, I and I think this, the, that the airline analogy is, is, is apt here, too. It's 
maybe not as much, but I, you know, this is certainly a case of the tide, you know, potentially raising all boats where if people get used to a higher standard of these devices, you know, certainly, certainly uh, Tesla's en entry into the market has, has made the larger automotive manufacturers look a lot harder at better electric cars. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's proven that there is a market for them yeah. and at, you know, attainable prices as well and with ranges that are practical for real human beings. Like us, um, man. That 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 week we spent on the in the I'm Eve. Oh my God, <laughs> that was rough. Yeah, we uh, Peter, we um, spent uh, in Portland for an Engadget show episode. We were driving around with the Mitsubishi I, which has an official range of I think 85 miles. We were lucky to get 60 something out of it, but uh, ultimately riding behind trucks. Yes, drafting. Uh, <laughs> it was uh, a, a nice little car, but it you need to be never more than 20 miles away from a charger to have which a is, car. Which uh, is hard to do in pretty much the the entire world, unless you're in Portland, which is actually full of chargers. Well, unless you're driving to Seattle from Portland. That didn't which we go were so well. unable to do. Nah. Didn't go so well. We got some lovely pancakes yeah. along the way at the charging station. Those were pretty good. <laughs> pretty good. Uh, so there's also another uh, little bit of news from Tesla this week in that people discovered a hidden menu within the interface, which is displayed, of course, on that giant 17-inch IPS panel that's kind of wedged in between the seats up front, um, showing some features that are disabled right now, but uh, including blind spot detection, adaptive cruise control, and lane departure warning. Those are all things that, again, I pointed out in the review as really being needed of a car of that price point. You expect those in a Mercedes or a BMW at that price point. Tesla doesn't have those yet. Um, I'm guessing that these are not things that you'll be able to hit a button and turn on, uh, but it does show that Tesla's working on them. So presumably the next generation Model S, maybe next year, uh, will have smarts like that, which is really, I think, as far as I'm concerned, really the only thing that's missing at this point. How hackable is that? Um is that tablet? You know, I haven't seen anybody hack the thing yet, actually. I'd like to, to hack, it, hack it to improve the graphics, which feel it, like... Yeah. It, it is, yeah. Oh. I mean, if you don't like skeuomorphism, it's 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 definitely trying to be like this chrome metal... Yeah, I don't like it either. It's a little bit sluggish, too. It's, it's running Linux, so presumably it's hackable. But I'm just guessing that a lot of people who, you know, have the money don't necessarily have the ability to hack it or... Or the time. The, or, or the desire to hack um, their incredibly hack expensive yourself. cars. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> I think it's like, I wouldn't necessarily want to hack it just... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just in case it causes some problems. Sure, sure. Yeah, and unlike most infotainment systems, this, this system actually has access to the you know details coming from the car. So you know, if you hacked your Ford Sync or whatever, you could change the radio station or do whatever. But you couldn't yeah. be able to detect the engine schematics or anything like that. This has actually got you know real time speed, performance, uh, range, all that stuff being pumped into that display. So in theory, if you could hack that thing, you'd have a lot of control over the car, much more so than your average um, infotainment system. Yeah, but you'll probably wake up in Elon Musk's. You've been waiting to, uh, we've been waiting for an invite for an event. Who knows? I like the idea of a phone that just kind of wills itself into existence. <laughs> <laughs> it's announced in Vanity we, Fair. The phone first. posted those. <laughs> <laughs> like you're just flipping through Vanity Fair and suddenly the phone just kind of falls in your lap out of there. That'd be an interesting way. Oh, it's also it. the first sentient phone. I don't know if they yeah. mentioned that in the uh, list we, of specs. We are uh, talking pure view optics, though we don't know if it'll be like the 920 pure view or the 8 weight preview, presumably more like the former than the latter. Who knows? Uh, Carl Zeiss lens, which again is something similar to what we've seen previously. Presumably more performance. Um, Better be. Yeah. <laughs> there's um, women on a beach in the ad, so I don't know what we can learn from that. Uh, great to read in sunlight, sure. obviously. That's, waterproof. Actually, that's something that Nokia's talked about quite a yeah. bit. So, hey, waterproof could be a big thing. I don't think sure. it's going to be waterproof. No, I'm just saying. I think it would be nice on the beach. Yeah. What, I'll take things that would be nice on the beach for a thousand, yeah. Peter. <laughs> <laughs> sunscreen. Uh, the answer is equal. It's a sunscreen dispenser. 928. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, an optical image stabilization as well. Again, like the 920. So, oh. it sounds like a, a, an up, upgraded 920 in some ways. I'm sure, it's gonna like be a, I'm sure it's going to be a phenomenal camera. I mean, oh, yeah. yeah. I, I'm wondering, and, and, and this is an honest question. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to slight Nokia at all, but I, I'm wondering um, how big of a selling point optics are at this point for people not you know. as much not as much as they should not, be. not as much as as nokia is hoping or hcc well, I, for that i item. think that i mean hcc obviously yeah. Yeah, made it a selling point too and, and i mean i think that um uh, part of it is that cameras and phones have gotten for the most part i mean i think the uh um so good that yeah. um are good enough for most people that they I'm don't sure. really you know care all that much about getting something substantially better or at least going out of their way to get something substantially better. But I think um, it is good to have points of differentiation, and I'm sure mm -hmm. with the 928, there's going to be other things that they, you know, that Nokia points to. I mean, it's going to be. I think that they're. This is not supposed to be a polycarbonate phone, right? Is that 
have we heard something about this? Yeah, it was talk about that having uh, having an alloy chassis. Yeah, I mean it's hard to tell from the pictures, but it looks like it's going to be a, a something that's uh, not plastic. Um, and even though I mean the polycarbonate that they've used in their phone, their Lumia phones to date, has been pretty good. But um, I think that if they kind of pitch this as like their most premium, mm -hmm. high class, uh, you, know, you know, device so far, and and I. And they've had success with that in the past. They've done special issue phones before with yeah. really nice optics or really nice um, chassis, which I think has been relatively successful for them. Then I, yeah. I think I think probably what it comes down to, though, for 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 optics and and I think you're you're right that it doesn't matter to most people. I think part of the reason why is what people are actually doing with the photos that they take on their phone, which is you know, wh you know what 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 are most people you know they're they're posting them to like Twitter or Facebook. You probably don't need a forty one megapixel image to do that true and people aren't going to do the things to optimize to get a great photo yeah. and if you're just going to throw some put some filter on it anyway it's yeah. like it's like even like even like the the panorama photos i mean they're really cool at first and i saw you know when everybody bought bought their iphone 5 they went out and tried it but mm -hmm. how useful has that actually been for anybody what if the world had more great ultra pixels filters. Oh, that man, yeah, realtors for sure. Yeah, when I was buying um, buying a house, it was really nice to be able to just go boop and walk into each room and get a nice, that's the sound that the panorama mode makes, by the way, when mm -hmm. you're taking that mm -hmm. picture. Um, you get yeah. paid five cents for every time somebody does that? Absolutely, <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> payable too, send your checks. Uh, yeah, I think that's definitely a killer feature for that. But ultimately, that's not something that everyone's doing every day, sure. at least I hope not. Uh, John Rubenstein resurfaced after, maybe he was on the beach, maybe he was the one taking the Lumi 9 pictures. Stein. Stein or Stein? Stein or Stein? Is it Stein? It's Ein. That's really? Stein? I thought it was Ruben Stein. It's E-I-N. So well, it's I. Can, it can go either way. Germanic pronunciation would be Stein. I've been saying Stein. Peter? Peter? I've been saying Stein. Stein. But really? Yeah. Okay. John Rubenstein. Either way, however you pronounce it, he's now <laughs> part of Qualcomm's board. Yes! Board of Directors. Um, interestingly, I was having a conversation with uh, Paul Jacobs of Qualcomm about this very oh, man Oh, just a little name drop there. Um, I was just checking. Is it Qualcomm or Qualcomm? Yeah. <laughs> Qualcomm over. I don't see any umlauts or other uh, indications of diary here. Uh, anyhow, um, so good for you, John. It's Qualcomm, actually. Qualc good for you, John. Like, what does that mean for future? The future? I don't, I don't think it's going to make much of a difference for Qualcomm. He's I mean, on, it's, he's on, on the board, so it's not like he's going to be directly involved with, with products or anything. In yeah, that or what, may, you know, what difference it makes for him. It's his, his Oh, it's it's returned to to. Is he going to see more, more things? <laughs> at, yeah, I mean, is he? Do you, I mean, do you, do you see him taking a more? I think he's retired. Hands, you think he's done? Yeah, if I were him, that, yeah. Uh, just, after what went down at HP, sure. And uh, well, why would you want it? Like sure. at this point, like you ha he's well. Clearly, he's still got some some dog in the race. He's still interested. sure, but I'm saying, but he has so much money that it's like why? I mean, and and. and why put yourself through like all yeah. the heartbreak that you went through with Palm all over again? I mean, you know, maybe else. he, maybe he, maybe he likes being in charge of a company. Maybe he likes the executive position. Maybe he likes, you know, having a more hands-on approach. So, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people get to a point where they can't really operate from the sidelines anymore. Maybe he likes being acquired and fighting with the yeah. new CEO. And I don't know. I'm, but also, what would I he mean, run? Yeah, yeah. Uh, unless Qualcomm starts churning out their own products. I mean, I, I don't see him really wanting to design new systems on a chip and is it systems on a chip systems on a chip right i think that's probably the way systems to do it on a chip. yeah systems on a chip. systems on a chip do you know mobile processors i don't really see that being his thing he's much more into overall systems and and you know ui design and hardware design and creating an, uh, an integral package of a device unless qualcomm wants to start no, making the reason why you bring someone like him onto your board is for the relationships that he brings and so you know, think about it. When he worked at Palm, he had direct relationships with people like carriers and distributors and, uh, you know, things like that. And so uh, for Qualcomm, as yeah. they start to deepen their relationships and start to, you know, work more, you know, start to interface more with the Verizons and, and Vodafones of the world. I mean, having someone who can get, you know, sure. the right people on speed dial makes a big difference. Well, he's been everywhere, too. Yeah, he, he knows Qualcomm, all those people. Yeah. He does? Yeah, and it also in terms of, you know, getting inside the minds of what do these companies want when they're making purchases of, of CPUs and other chipsets like that too. Yeah. He certainly brings a lot to the table in that regard. So well, what's funny is I don't recall. I mean, Palm didn't use. Did they, they didn't use Qualcomm in the wow, pre? Did they? Time. I never. I've never really thought about it. We we need some uh, <laughs> some music that we can play when we're actually yeah. when we're frantically googling. It's a, no, it's a TI chip. Yeah, that's what I thought. An old map with with PowerVR graphics. Yeah. 
So, yeah, interesting. I'll, I'll pour one out for the pre. I, yeah. yeah, I think we all will. I think yeah. we all had a uh, spot in our heart for the Palm Pre. Yeah. Qualcomm's definitely ascended a bit since the, since the pre days. <laughs> Everybody has, right? Yeah. The whole market has, thank goodness. Uh, wow, well, we, we are uh, at, at, at a point where there is a... S- where was your little I brought your him little home. guy? You didn't I brought him home. I'm going to bring him in. With a ridiculously fit uh, figure of myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, Brian got to go visit 3D Systems this week. Yeah. And came home with uh, toys of him and me yeah. and, and Ben <laughs> and Harrison, our ben Harrison. director. Yeah, they've got a new, uh, new office space that <clears> they're <throat> setting up on. You know how dangerous it is to be a red shirt. <sighs> so... <laughs> <laughs> there was yeah there was a I, I, there was a old conversation um which was i just wanted i wanted tim in the shirt that would make him look the most like Riker. yeah yeah Riker didn't have pecs like these i'm just gonna they just they, gonna they, they just out. they just didn't have the the tng uniforms yeah one time sadly <laughs> yeah so uh you can it's what 70 dollars you take a, a picture of yourself from the front and a profile of your face mm-hmm. and from that they can generate a 3d model there's got to be a lot of manual working in here because there's no way it was this detailed yeah yeah um yeah i mean th- yeah yes yes ab- absolutely there is especially with with those shots you know it's it's certainly not like them actually doing a full yeah. scan of your face it's it's, um, it's reasonably impressive it is it is yeah i think they did a really a really good job on it and the, the machines themselves especially are really the cool. muscles mm-hmm. yeah they really got your ass down there tim uh, they, 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 they do it on the same, the same machine that, um, they did the, the paranormal stuff on and it's, mm. it's actually a really super cool machine. Obviously this is, you know, one of their industrial ones and 3d, 3d systems is kind of the leader in high end industrial 3d printers. So they're the ones who are doing, you know, a lot of these things for like the Boeings and the Nikes of the world. Um, and they're actually the company, their founder actually invented 3d printing. So they've, they've got some clout. There as well. That was about 30 years ago, and this it's this machine that has um, a bed of powder on it, and it's it's basically like it's cornstarch. It's, it's no, it's like gypsum particle board. Gypsum. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. And it runs. Um, it uses off-the-shelf <laughs> HP color printers, uh, uh, c- cartridges um, mixed with another solution, and they shoot it into the bed, and it basically congeals the figure into that so when it's all done you still got this flat bed of powder and you actually have to kind of go in and excavate the little figures out and then put them into the other side and get a like a high pressure blower on there to get the rest of the the detritus off of it and then um pour over a solution that's very similar to to super glue which both hardens it and then brings the colors out so for for uh of a small section of the population, but a very enthusiastic section of the population, this is going to be, I think, a very good, very good birthday gift. Yeah, and the, the only question is, how do you sneakily get a front and a profile shot of an individual? The Facebook, that this probably. Made, you think? Yeah. But it is. I mean, it's it's obviously not perfect. I mean, this is this is some. some I mean, the the the, but, the buttocks again. are pretty. I'd say about a hundred percent. Okay. I shouldn't have drank it. <laughs> it's a close call. Uh, yeah, my, mine's actually, and, and I think a lot of it has to do with the, the, the facial hair, because I think mine's actually probably a little more more accurate. Yeah, my nose is a little bit strange. But yeah. it's pretty good, uh, and uh, it feels like sandpaper, which is a little bit weird, too. But yeah. there's also a Star Wars version that's, or something like this at Star at um, Disney, where it, you can go and yeah. get yourself scanned and pay. I think it's $100 there to get yourself but on carbonite. a... Carbonite. In Carbonite or on the Stormtrooper, Stormtrooper body. I think they're larger, too. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the other thing too. Is is that the beds on these things are so large that you could you could basically get a figure about that large made from it. That large being roughly a foot and a half for those who are listening to Thank the you MPC version. Thank how you far for apart my tuning in? By the way, we we love you listening. <laughs> um, pretty pretty awesome stuff. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah. Pretty they awesome. 3D printed a gun on that hand? They did, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Should we talk about 3D printed guns? That was a big story from over the weekend. Uh, of the what we can, From what we can tell, the first fully 3D printed gun, with the exception being, well, one, two things really. One being the striking pin, which was yep. made from a nail, and the second thing being uh, the bullet, of course. He just yeah, pulled the, bull print, the blueprints. The, oh, they pulled them? No yeah, way. the State Department demanded. From, uh, was that in really? Thingiverse? Or from, dis- yeah. from, from Defense Distributed. Wow. It, yeah. it was downloaded, I think, 50,000 in the first day, uh, and then it was, I think, 100,000 as of a couple of days after that. Wow. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Uh, so we got an official letter from the Secretary of State telling me who they were, what their authority was under U.S. law, and telling me that, that telling me they want to review these files to see if they're Class 1 munitions. So um, everybody who's interested, you can go right now to wikileaks.org slash 3D printed gun. <laughs> yeah. Go 
I don't think it's going to be hard getting these for John. Uh, this is obviously not a new conversation, um, you know, and 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 I, I I do think it brings up some 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 interesting points. I, I don't think that this is, this itself is. A, a very realistic proposition right now. I think it's probably still a lot easier to actually get your hands on a regular gun than it is to actually 3D print one and go through yeah. all those steps. The scary part here is that this is almost entirely made of plastic, so it wouldn't trigger any metal detector. Sure. So you could walk into a lot of buildings um, and and not be detected. I, I wonder how the um, the emission and scan uh, uh, detectors at, at airports would work, because ultimately it was, it's still kind of roughly gun-shaped. It's a little weird looking. Yeah, um, um, it's not the first plastic gun, though. No, it's, no there have been carbon fiber guns in yeah. the past, but those are... Very difficult to make and very expensive. The idea being, yeah. you could buy a couple hundred dollar three D printer and do it yeah. at home. Yeah, but I think it's more about and 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 the the gentleman who did this made it very clear that he wasn't even really doing it for gun advocacy purposes. He was just kind of trying to start a dialogue and probably and get his face on CNN as much as possible. And he did. Um, <laughs> what they should do is like you should be able to print a gun, but it should take like three weeks, like a cooling off period. <laughs> like yeah, you can print a gun, but you're a not going to be angry by the time it finishes. A literal <laughs> cooling off period. Yeah, like. <laughs> It's just really, really hot for three weeks. I mean, can you imagine sitting there and watching that gun print out and actually getting more and more angry yeah, like, because yeah. it's so slow? Come Finish on, so I can kill up. this guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you end up shooting a three D printer. Um, yeah, it's more about the diet. but. But what, it, this is one of the interesting things too. And and uh, you know, as the story was unfolding, again, I was at at three D Systems, and the, the weird the w- weird thing about it though is because of this, way more people know about three D printing than ever before. So this. Like the, the 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 other side of the sword is that this may be the story that really gets three D printing into people's consciousness. In a sad, as sad a thing way. that you can use to kill people. Yeah. You know, they're not talking about the. You know, they're not talking about the potential that that a lot of these researchers have have been looking into as far as like three D printing food for developing nations or um, organs. For organs. Uh, new you know, and and I, the timing the timing on this was was very clear, but um, uh, MakerBot did a press release about this hand. I mean, th- this thing had actually been out for a while. We saw it yeah. at um, South by Southwest and the plans went up on Thingiverse in January. But basically what it is, is it's prosthesis that's 3D printed. And the idea is you can make it much cheaper. So if you're um, if you're making a prosthetic hand for a child whose you know, body grows so quickly that otherwise it might not make sense to make that, you can, you can print this out. And very clearly they came out with this kind of the same week that everybody was talking about. 3D printing for, for guns, but that story is never going to be as as sexy, as exciting of a story, and it's not going to make its way into the 24-hour news cycle in the way that a 3D printed gun will. Which is kind of sad, the idea that you can create a custom, you know, custom appendage for yourself if you need to, with any color you want to, and any shape that you want to, and as exciting as you want to, and do it at home. But the, but the, and the other point is, is like, um, you know, and... <laughs> It, it, it's easy. It's it's pretty easy to make an explosive device. I mean, you know, it, it's it's easy to make a thing that can kill people without a three D printer right now. Yeah, it's what it comes down to. Basically, society relies on people not wanting to kill yeah. each other. Yeah, moral moral compass. You can't three D print a moral compass, Peter. Yeah, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> I haven't been on thing about week, on that. so I don't know. Well, I think uh, well, we'll just as an like aside, it. like the real challenge is going to be when they have, um, and these are being developed right now, which is basically printers for pharmaceuticals, where you mm-hmm. can um, do atom, you know, molecule yeah. by molecule, like or atom by atom, like create basically you know any sort of drug once you have the, the template. And right now, those are incredibly expensive, but you could see how there's a very practical application for pharmacies, which is you don't have to always, mm-hmm. you know. Um, you know, you, I think we've all got like gone to a pharmacy. They're like, "Oh, you get a prescription filled." They're like, "Oh, it's going to take us like two days to get your medicine." And again, and yeah. you're like, "I'm going to die," you know, like I need this now. And the developing world also. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, when somebody has this in their house and they want to print themselves, bad. you know, ecstasy or whatever. Or if you're yeah. on the bridge of the enterprise and you want some Earl Grey tea hot, you know, perhaps then you could have it produced out of a sort of machine. No, That's did awesome. I go to no, no. Star Trek? But you know, the only thing that will stop a bad guy with a cup of Earl Grey tea. It's hot enough. Is a good guy. Just throw that in the face. <laughs> a cup of Earl, Earl Grey tea. Good job, Peter. Well, 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 Someone was going to make that joke. It may as well have been me. Uh, questions. We've got a couple questions here. Is anything, anything else in the world of tech news we should discuss before we move on to questions from our... Someone asked us if we use Waze. Yes, that was uh, came in from uh, Hot Milk GT on the Twitters. Uh, do you use Waze? Do you use Waze, Peter? I don't have a car. Waze being W A Z E. I don't have a car. I don't have a car. No car at all. 
Brian? I can't drive. I have a car, but I do not use Waze. So You're not allowed o- to drive? 0 for 3. Yeah. Joe, do you use Waze? Too many strikes. Too many strikes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Joe's saying no. 0 for 4 in the Engadget podcast room. Well, you don't Waze. live anywhere there where there's traffic. There's traffic. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Oh, there's a pregnant raccoon crossing the street. <laughs> yeah. All of the cars. Yeah, uh, and then uh, <laughs> all the keys goes by while the gosling's behind it. You know, that oh, happens. Yeah. That happens. Uh, Joe Frawley on Google Plus asking, at what cost do you think Google Glass will retail for for normal consumers? So we're talking about the actual retail release of the device, not the current production developer edition. What, what price do we want it to be or what price do we What think? will it? So he's asking for us to, to put our money where our mouth is. It's got to be under a grand, right? I could see it being like nine ninety nine, yeah. and then going down to 500 a year after that. See, I think they've got to get it well under 500 to, to really be to successful. Start? I, I think they've got to get it between I don't know to I start think, I think they. I, I, don't, I don't think they expect that it's going to be hugely successful in the first generation. I think it's going to be really, I think that it's going to be capacity constrained for that first generation yeah. too. And so I think having it at a price point where you have to really want, I mean, even a thousand dollars is kind of amazing um, when you think about it. But, but, but what, I mean, is that display in there expensive enough? Because it's an a, a, a 18 it's month the old miniaturization and yeah. things like it's that. A, it's a battery. I mean, it's, yeah, but it's, it's not like they're making a, you know, another, yet another smartphone. And also they're not making it again. I mean, they're not, they're not making it like, you know, millions of them, which yeah. helps bring the price down. If they're going to make right. hundred thousand or fifty thousand, it's going to be tough. I, I'd say nine ninety nine is safe. I don't think it'll be fifteen hundred. I think they got to get down to five hundred bucks. I, I think it'll be. I don't. I, I'd be impressed if they did that, and it's not impossible. But I think that I that feels like first a year. Generation, I don't. It yeah, feels like se- second happen. generation consumer. Uh, Tim, I've got a question for yes. my brain right now. Yeah. Why aren't you wearing Google Glass? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's a good point. There were some people in chat wondering that too. Um, did you break them in anger? Mm-hmm. I did not break them. I think Ben's been playing with them. Shot him with doing this. Uh, I have. Uh, uh, is it here? Is it? It is here. Okay. Yeah, I've mm-hmm. kind of run out of things to. Do <laughs> class? Um, so uh, we should talk about. This. So there was, but that's funny. That's like saying like that's like saying, oh, I've already checked my email and made a phone call on this phone. I guess I don't need to use my phone anymore. <laughs> that's what happened. First phone I got, I checked it. <laughs> yeah, made, made some calls. Yeah, right back in the box. Came back to it six months later. Um, no, I mean, it, it to me, it's just not adding enough to be yeah. worth putting on my face all the time because you know e- either worth I'm being stopped on the street a hundred times well that's the thing so I, I, I confess but people did that before the glass a little well, bit very tired have you seen his butt it's right here if you have it. yeah, <laughs> it's right it's 3D printed um, I've actually very carefully avoided looking yeah. look at it. it's, it's it. weirdly it's only look people it. from behind him that are stopping him I yeah so as much as I like showing pe- glass to people and having them get the experience of it, it's very difficult to actually get anywhere um, when you're wearing glass because you do get stopped constantly. You're saying you might not keep being the nicest guy in tech if you have to wear these things around. <laughs> uh, or I might miss every train and every plane and everything the else. The latest guy in tech. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a new a new title for me. Um, but if I'm sitting, if I'm at home at my computer, there's no reason at all for me to have them on, really, yeah. because I can get all my emails and calls and everything sure. else. Um, really, the most use for me is walking around somewhere that I don't know where I am, uh, and ultimately, I haven't been doing that over the past two weeks. Um, so, yeah, it's it's just a little bit challenging to wear them on in the public streets at this point. Have we, that too. I feel like we have not a lot of people talked about game gaming potential like augmented reality gaming potential yeah and i really think we're going to see some announcements there at io uh i would be shocked if we didn't see something it, it, it's that. interesting though in, in in a way it kind of defeats like the whole dialogue that or the whole monologue i guess that google's been having all along which is let's make these things as invasive as possible you know if you're if you're if you're if you're putting them on to play a game it's like that's the main thing you want to do with them and that and yeah. that 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 brings us back to those original questions which are like should can i wear this thing while i'm driving a car yeah yeah it, it's uh it's i think that'll be the next interesting development and, and i would be shocked if we didn't see something like that at io in fact google has been pushing out ingress invites to everybody who goes to io ingress is their augmented reality sort of location based game um, I'd be really surprised if there wasn't some sort of glass tie into that. And if they do that right, that could be a very, very cool talking point about glass. If you got their augmented reality gaming thing right, uh, I think that could help to sell a bunch What's too. What's that location-based game that they have for Android? Um, Ingress. Ingress. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's the one that they just pushed. The battery it, destroying. It plays out to, <laughs> to everybody. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so everybody at IO will have that, and uh, I'm eager to see what happens. And we should probably mention that IO is next week. How can we drain glasses battery faster? Is there? <laughs> yeah, do we have exactly. the technology? Yeah, so they just pushed out an update, um, EX5, so or XC5, XC5, um, which is 
basically giving some UI updates. You can now do a long tap anywhere and do a Google search, which is nice. Um, the, the battery recognition is better, so it'll tell you more accurately how your battery is doing. Uh, but they disabled background uploading if you're not on Wi-Fi and connected. So basically, your battery life's going to be better, but you can't upload stuff when you're just wandering around the streets, which is a bit of a drawback as far as I'm concerned. I, I mean, it, 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 should, it should at least be an option. I don't know if it should be default because, again, if batteries are an issue, if it's automatically uploading everything, yeah. that's going to just drain it. it. It makes sense. I mean, it, it definitely makes sense to, I guess, depending on where you are and where you live and how much access you have to open internet. But I, I think that makes sense as as a model, like going from place to place and uploading it as soon as you get there. I, I See, I, I want my stuff uploaded immediately. I yeah. think that's part of the joy of Glass that, hey, I'm here on stage at this thing. Check it out. Um, I think yeah. that... That to me is, I think, I think it, cool. Yeah, it's an. It, it would be nice if it's something that you can enable and disable. I think. Uh, let's see. We've got uh, a couple more questions, which we'll try to get through here quickly. From uh, Khalid in chat, do you expect production HTC phone? The HTC One is better than the Galaxy S4 when selling, which I think he's asking. Will the One beat the Galaxy S4 in terms of sales? I think sadly no, not. No. <laughs> which is I would like to. But uh, the production. Well, I mean. I, d- I do think that the one is the better of the two phones, but um, it's, uh, I don't think that uh, anyone, I don't think even HTC expects them to sell more of them than the S4. But HTC won 3D. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That 3D. could really split the market wide open. Really would, yeah. Bring 3D, 3D back 3D in a phone. big, big way. Yeah. Oh, that's great questions coming on YouTube as well, so I have a lot of places to check for questions now. <laughs> Apologies, folks on YouTube, for uh, us not uh, recognizing your conversation here because we're not used to having to look on YouTube, too. Uh, we've got a question from Jean. Uh, what do you think about uh, VZW not releasing a flagship phone for six months now? What is Verizon waiting for, Peter? Um, I guess someone to ask them nicely. <laughs> <laughs> to say please we've uh, heard oh, sorry, no i mean uh, uh you know it, it's um i mean it, it's funny how carriers work about this stuff because i think that sometimes um you know a verizon of all the carriers um it sometimes has the most attitude of that like the phones are less important than the service itself um, they, they've changed that a little bit they've, changed, they've gotten better yeah. but they really had this attitude uh, it was more a few years ago but yeah. of like it doesn't matter what phone you have because it's we have the best service and that's the most. That's what customers come mm-hmm. to Verizon for. And so the phones are almost secondary, which of course is absurd. But yeah. um, but you know we do know a lot of people that will only use Verizon because of coverage or because of quality of service. So there is that. I also th- think I also think that that's that's that that's a holdover from another era because I, I I do think that before the iPhone came along, that was probably a lot more the case. Yeah, but there might be that same sort of pro- prejudice there. Uh, I, you know, I I don't know. I mean, it's uh, I guess it depends on on how you define flagship phone. Um, a little bit, but um, yeah, I'm not sure what they're. I mean, we've also heard supply issues for the uh, the Galaxy S4, yeah. which is probably slowing things down a little bit too. And um, we've also heard kind of anecdotally that Verizon's not really that nice to work with. That they, well, they kind of force hardware changes on on carrier or on manufacturers to you know cut back on storage or do other changes. Put yeah. their logo um, in weird places. Yeah, that too. they've yeah. definitely. Yeah. I've heard about at least at least uh, yeah phones that have come out where they would. Verizon would not allow them to offer more than 16 gigabytes of storage yeah. because they insist or expandable storage or expandable storage or anything like that. And, the, and of course, it's not the carrier that gets the heat for that. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's the manufacturer. Yeah, uh, we won't name any more names. I might name names, but oh, wow. maybe not this podcast. Next, oh, something yeah. to look forward to. The next Peter podcast. names names would be a podcast I'd listen to. Yeah, yeah. names names like Exposing. Brian, Brian Rubenstein, yeah. Rubenstein. <laughs> Uh, the first I, half is all about pronunciation. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard it's Rubenstein, by the way. Despite the fact that it's E-I-N, and my German teacher said that that should be I, not E, but whatever, man. So, yeah, so, it's, so it's Rubenstein. Rubenstein is what I'm hearing. Rubenstein. Seinfeld. So says Joe. Joe is shrugging his shoulders now, which is not very encouraging. So what about Bruce Springsteen? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good place for us to uh, call, Spells this, slightly different. Call, this, <laughs> call this podcast to a close. Uh, you can pronounce it however you want. If you have that's any other the e Street Band, yeah. there's fun there's an e pronunciation uh, yeah, suggestions for us, uh, please feel free to share. We'd love to hear how, what else we've... You've been Time Stevens. Said wrong. We're, out of, we're, we're all out of Tim. You know how many times I've been called Time in chat? Many, many times, Brian. I've been many, called many, times. <laughs> many, 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 many times. Many, many Tims. I've been called Time. Uh, thank you, Peter, for joining us as ever. Peter's uh, at Peter Rojas on the Twitters. Brian Heater's at Be Heater on Twitter. And happy birthday, buddy. Sure. Make sure you send Brian uh, cards or flowers or 
We should have a contest. Was, Whoever guesses his birthday wins a prize. We got a one seven shot. Yeah. Uh, I will unfortunately not be here next week because there's a little thing happening in San Francisco for Google. I'm so probably not gonna let's just record something in San Francisco. All right, let's do it. Well, maybe we'll yeah. do a remote podcast. You guys are killing me because I'm not going. Uh, I'm maybe we'll fly through to San Francisco for very different reasons. Yeah. Uh, we'll figure something out for next week. But uh, I hope you join us. I hope you enjoy this podcast, and I hope that uh, you're in a wonderful place because we love you all. Oh. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Oh, happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, everybody, because we love you even more than everybody else.